I'm Jennifer Billick. Uh, this is really fun. My mother always told me that I should have a podium, and this is the first time I've ever spoken at a podium. Um, so it's just really good. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here, um, and to thank um, Matt Bell and Douglas Jeffrey for inviting me here to speak tonight. And I hope you all have a big bottle of wine at home because I'm going to depress the hell out of you. <laughs> um, but I also want to provide some clarity, hopefully, on what's um, transpiring in the name of transgenderism. And you can forever after in this uh, talk just put air quotes around that word. Um, why it's happening and who's profiting from it. Um, I began to research this um, about 10 years ago. All the people that I knew, all the people that I was working with, anybody that acknowledged biological reality, reality or tried to have a um, critique about this ideology was censored. And so I knew immediately, uh, you know, this is very dangerous. This is, this is a lot of power uh, to censor this many people. And why are they doing it? Um, if you have a human rights movement, you want people to know about it. You want to speak your case, right? Well, that wasn't the case, so that's how I started to go down this rabbit hole. Um, so what I found was that um, there's a whole lot of very, very wealthy people in the biotech, pharmaceutical, technological, and financial industries that are driving this ideology. Um, but first, let's situate ourselves in time. As a species, we're beginning a new stage of human development, um, emerging from the information and digital ages. The future will see more developments in human data collection to build greater systems of artificial intelligence and engineering, biotechnology, transhumanism, and the creation of greater virtual systems of reality, or synthetic realities. In the past decade, 10 years, all of our corporations, international human rights and non-governmental organizations, global investment houses, banks, medical institutions, legal firms, governments and educational bodies simultaneously uh, discovered that the natural world and hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution via sexual dimorphism somehow got it wrong. It's all been one big mistake. It's being propagated that science has discovered there are hundreds of maybe infinite sexes and to manifest full potential in the expression of these alternate sexes, humanity, uh, coincidentally enough, needs the uh, medical industrial complex to bring, it to bring those expressions to fruition. Further, the medical industrial complex is so altruistic that they'll silence anyone who gets in the way of its efforts for the diversity of expression of these alternate sexes. People, especially politicians, have become terrified to say that women are adult human females, almost never arguing what men are because that's not up for question. Simultaneously, manipulation of our DNA and CRISPR technology to control the human genome are well underway. Through the use of in vitro fertilization, embryo and sperm cryopreservation, embryo transfer, sperm injections, surrogacy, and research into artificial wombs, etc., developing technologies are poised to usurp human female reproduction. This is happening in conjunction with women's legal and linguistic erasure to promote a spectrum of sexes. The growth of gender clinics for children will see many children in the next generation sterilized and in need of assisted reproductive technologies 
if they choose to have children. <clears throat> My research has shown that we are starring in a corporate coup to colonize human sex for profit and to engineer the evolution of humanity. Though this is far more believable than the idea that Western societies are being rapidly overhauled for the fraction of humanity who don't believe that they are male or female, we have spent a decade arguing about and obsessing over gender people. The word transgenderism is not fit for the purpose of communication. It does not define anything clearly, but instead obscures the industry manifested in its name. It's an umbrella term with no borders, under which sit too many conflicting ideas, allowing its definitional goalposts to move when anyone critiques its ideology and the markets forming around it. Instituting gender identity as a legal concept deconstructs what it means to be human at core, a biologically sexually dimorphic species. Gender is an obfuscation. The corporate state is deconstructing sex. One of the uses of the word transgenderism is, a re is as a rebranding of the word transsexualism, which is rooted in transvestic fetishism and is the, collo the colloquial term for the paraphilia of autogynephilia, whereby men aroused at the thought of themselves as females wear stereotypical women's clothing, specifically undergarments, to satisfy a sexual compulsion. This used to happen in private. When pharmacology and technology made it possible for the tiny number of men with this fetish to escalate their behaviors to appropriate surgically constructed facsimiles of female biology or synthetic sex characteristics, Transsexualism took root in the medical industry. In 1965, when John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, opened a clinic to manipulate human sex characteristics, the first clinic to do so in the US, it was ex for experimental reasons, not political ones. It became a model for other clinics even after closing its doors in 1979, after finding the surgeries were not successful. A 2011 Swedish study mirroring John Hopkins' findings found that the risk of suicide was much higher for people who'd had surgeries to change their outward sex characteristics versus the general public. It should be noted that these genital mutilations were performed on homosexual men because of modern society's intense homophobia. This still occurs in other countries such as Iran. This is how a paraphilia of adult men has come to be associated with people who are same-sex attracted, though they are radically different experiences. Homosexuality is embodied sexual desire grounded in reciprocity. Autogynephilia is an objectifying, compulsive, and dissociative fetish. It's 40 years since John Hopkins closed its clinic doors, and yet the Gender Mapping Project organization estimates there are now thousands of gender clinics around the world, 400 that offer to medically manipulate the sex of children, often children who don't conform to strict sex role stereotypes and have been assessed as likely to grow up to be gay. China opened its first clinic last year. And there are two Californias, uh, at least two clinics in California that prefer, perform what they call non-binary surgeries on men's genitalia, creating a cavity with inverted scrotal skin while leaving the penis intact. They also perform nullification surgeries by removing sex organs entirely. For the purposes of this talk and for the industry side of this issue that I intend to highlight, transsexualism as a paraphilia that compulsively and specifically objectifies female reproductive biology needs a more vital examination. Exacerbated by the escalation of the porn industry and made possible by the growth of powerful technologies tied to profiteering, this fetish of adult men aroused by appropriating synthetic female sex characteristics has created a perfect storm that's manifested into a new industry, the gender industry. 
Autogynophilia reduces women's sex humanity to parts for purchase, as all aspects of the sex industries do. Support is flourishing for this development under a human rights framework. While women are being erased in language and law, and the men with this paraphilia are being given more prominence. As the technology in pharmaceuticals to perform more realistic synthetic sex surgeries advances, society is forced to accept this paraphilia and the, accept the ideology that's developed around it, which denies our biological reality, raising us above the natural world where we thrive in a living tapestry. The gender lobby, or the techno-totalitarians, as I like to call them, and their insane assertions that human sex is not binary but exists on a spectrum, are not just a political movement invested in virtuousness run amok. Powerful people with money drive this ideology, not just for profit, of which there is plenty, but for engineering human biology toward a transhuman and eventually a posthuman evolution. Transhumanism is the movement of humanity toward a more integral fusion with technologies and artificial intelligence. Posthumanism is the transformation of our species into something beyond human. Eventually, or so those working toward this goal hope, we will live in a virtual reality without the need for reproductive sex, genetic families, or even food, and women will become obsolete. This ideology is being engineered into children's and young adults' social media and television programs and is taught in their schools. Children and young people are the target market of this new industry and for biological intrusions into their anatomy, which is why they're being taught to dissociate from biological reality and their sexed bodies. Girls are lining up for elective double mastectomies thinking they can be boys, and creating funding um, campaigns for their surgeries on the GoFundMe app. At last count, there was 42,000 of them. Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical giant markets these surgeries as liberating. In 2018, at the Ronald Reagan Medical Center at the University of California, Los Angeles, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology advertised several options for young females uh, who think they can be men to have their reproductive organs removed, a procedure called gender-affirming care. Women are losing the language specific to their biology and are now called birthing people, menstruators, and chest feeders to be inclusive of men. This is dehumanizing, and it's no accident. Before looking at a few of the key individuals driving the idea that sex exists on a spectrum and their interconnections with the techno-medical complex and the LGBT non-governmental organizations building the, frameworks, the framework of a human rights movement, let's look at the profiteering of the techno-medical complex around creating synthetic sexes regardless of the harms it breeds. Journalist Sue Donham, reporting on the market in puberty blockers for children, chronicles the cost of Lupron, a drug used to stop children's puberty, compared to its use for treating adult conditions in men and women. Pediatric versions of Lupron are far more expensive than adult versions. Lupron for the treatment of endometriosis in women is $4,800 for a three-month dose. While its pediatric version is $9,700 for the same dose. A subcutaneous implant for delivering the drug to children is $35,000, whereas a subcutaneous adult implant to administer Lupron for treatment of advanced prostate cancer costs $4,400. And the cost of those drugs run into hundreds and thousands of dollars when children are using them for up to seven years. If even 100 children took these drugs for seven years, that's 27 million in drug sales. And that's just the puberty blockers. 
Global Market Insights, a research form, firm, reported on the market for genital surgery for identity purposes, putting 2019 profits at $316 million, while projecting a 25% growth rate by 2026. This amounts to profits of $1.5 billion for the United States alone. The firm concluded that growth drivers for synthetic sexes are favorable government policies in the United States, greater awareness of the surgeries, technological advancements coupled with increasing effectiveness of the surgeries, and accessibility to surgical centers, sex surgical centers. It should be noted that although these surgeries were created by men, for adult men, the largest demographic choosing these surgeries now are adolescent females. We don't hear much about the demographic of middle-aged women choosing these surgeries. Opening markets in sexual identities could only have happened by violating the sex boundary between males and females. The paraphilia of transsexualism rebranded as cool and edgy for today's youth and added to a human rights umbrella of sexual identity accomplishes this. The market in sex manipulation surgery now has a new consumer base. The small civil rights movement of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals became a global purchasing juggernaut once the medical industrial complex infiltrated it during the 1980s AIDS crisis. Out Leadership, the business networking arm of the LGBT market, currently reports $3.7 trillion in buying power. By 2000, when the AIDS epidemic was brought under control, the two most powerful LGBT non-governmental organizations in America emerged. One was the Gill Foundation, started by billionaire Tim Gill. Gill is an American philanthropist and an LGBT rights activist. He was among the first open homosexuals to be on the Forbes 400 list of America's richest people. As of 2019, he was the largest donor to the LGBT rights movement in the US, in US history. Gill is also founder of the pioneering computer software company, Quark. He now owns an artificial intelligence company called Josh AI. The other largest LGBT rights NGO in the United States is Arcus Foundation. Founded by John Stryker, heir to his family's $17.1 billion medical supply corporation, Stryker Medical. John Stryker is also founding board member of Greenleaf Trust, a privately owned bank in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Stryker and Gill are not your typical grassroots activists. Stryker Medical owns 54 companies in 36 countries and sells its medical supplies to 100 countries across the world. Of the top 10 countries outside the U.S. using Stryker medical supplies, at least eight are hotbeds of gender activism and political pressure driving gender identity laws, including the U.K., Ireland, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and Australia. America is home to Stryker Medical and Arcus Foundation and is its largest consumer base. Their next largest consumer base is the UK, where Arcus Foundation has another branch at Cambridge University. Ireland, home to Transgender Equality uh, Network Ireland, or 10E, is a boiling cauldron of synthetic sex rights activism. 10E is funded by Transgender Europe, which is heavily funded by Arcus Foundation. Read Stryker Medical. Transgender Europe was established in 2005. It has 195 member organizations in 48 different countries. Ireland is also home to three branches of Stryker Medical and 19 of the top 20 global pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical corporations. Arcus Foundation poses as a human rights uh, organization, but it subsists on millions generated by Stryker Corporation stock. 
John Stryker has built the political scaffolding to drive synthetic sex surgeries as positive human progression and normal human expression into our cultures, our institutions, our laws, and more importantly and dangerously, the global market. Via his philanthropic funding to LGBT NGOs, universities, churches, sports, legal firms, and other organizations. Having successfully helped to drive gender ideology in Western cultures, Arcus Foundation is now sowing the seeds for normalizing synthetic sex identities in the global south with millions of dollars in funding to International Trans Fund. Who else in the world besides the American medical industrial complex? By some estimates bigger than the military industrial complex, could wield so much global power as to have the media, international corporations, global banks, investment houses, the largest law firms in the world, and the armed services do their bidding selling synthetic sex identities. We must also take into uh, consideration the ideology of Martine Rothblatt, a, a renowned American entrepreneur who identifies as transsexual and a transhumanist and who has appropriated the female sex with technologies and drugs. He co-founded Satellite Radio, owns United Therapeutics, a major bi biopharmaceutical corporation, worked on the human genome at the UN level, and was mentored into transhumanism by Ray Kurzweil of Google. Rothblatt created a robot replica of his wife, developed by Hanson Robotics. He has written and spoken about transcending flesh and is a strong presence at Out Leadership, the business networking arm of the LGBT lobby. He believes transgenderism is an on-ramp to transhumanism, and he created a technological transhumanist religion called Terrasum, whose credo is, we are making God as we are implementing technology that is ever more all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, and beneficent. Rothblatt is also a lawyer and the author of the very first gender bill. He worked with several other transsexual lawyers to give legal structure to physical dissociation from the sexed body. He has written extensively on the need to overhaul our system of labeling people as male or female based on their genitalia and the future of creating humans with reproduction, reproductive technologies. It should be noted here that many who fund the current gender industry that sterilizes young people are also invested in the technologies of assisted reproduction. Amazon launched its first fertility center in 2019, while the Bezos family has invested $166 million uh, in a, in a um, hospital in Brooklyn, New York that performs gender surgeries. Mark Benioff, owner of Time Magazine, co-CEO and co-founder of Salesforce, and a pioneer of cloud computing, funds clinics to medicalize children's natural puberty and has simultaneously invested in Overture Life, an embryology lab making in vitro fertilization more accessible than ever. Jennifer Pritzker and his family should not be overlooked in the development of synthetic sex identities. The Priskers are one of the richest families in America. They have made their fortune founding the Hyatt Hotel Corporation, but have since moved their investments to the techno-medical sector and now push synthetic sex as an identity. The Priskers have sent hundreds of millions of philanthropic dollars into educational, medical, cultural, military, and legal institutions in America, Canada, and Israel to drive the concept that human reproductive sex exists on a spectrum and is part of the human rights frame for the same sex attracted. Jennifer Pritzker was born James Pritzker. After ma marrying and fathering three children, he decided in middle age that he was a woman. Poof. He adopted a synthetic female identity and has sent millions of dollars via his philanthropic organization, Tawani Foundation, to institutionally change our ideas about sex. 
Tawani Enterprises, the private investment counterpart to the Philanthropic Foundation, invests in and partners with Squadron Capital, a Chicago-based private investment vehicle that acquires medical device companies that manufacture instruments for surgical use, mirroring John Stryker's trajectory. Jennifer's cousin, Penny Pritzker, who sits on the board of Microsoft, was usually, uh, usually influential in getting President Obama elected and was later chosen as his Secretary of Commerce. Obama became the first trans president, meeting at the White House with the higher ups in the LGBT lobby, and he, grew, he drove bills through the government to support synthetic sex as an identity. In 2019, Illinois Governor J.B. Prisker, Jennifer's cousin and Penny's brother, issued an executive order titled Strengthening Our Commitment to Affirming and Inclusive Schools to welcome and support children with manufactured sex identities. It established a task force to outline statewide criteria for schools and teachers that recommended districts amend their school board policies to strengthen protection protections for transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students. In 2021, Governor Pritzker signed into law a new sex education bill for all public schools in Illinois, the first of its kind, designed in accordance with the second edition of the National Sex Education Standards to update sex education curricula in K-12 schools. The bill will be implemented on August 1st this year just a few days from now. National sex education standards, which teach children about gender ideology and the medical manipulation of children's sex for identity purposes, were funded by the Grove Foundation, whose fortune comes from the now deceased Andrew Grove, former CEO of Intel Corporation. Visions of transhumanism and a post-humanity where we fuse with AI might be the reason new legal rights are demanded by those who promote synthetic sexes. Robots and AI don't have a reproductive system. They are assigned synthetic sex when they are created, which mimics the language of gender identity ideology. Chile passed a law last year to protect the rights of genetically modified human beings, the first country to do so. The world's first genetically modified babies were born in Hong Kong in 2018. The tech sector supports the synthetic sex industry by funding various LGBT organizations and using their collective financial weight as a threat to change policies. In 2017, our major tech organizations, including Apple, Intel, Amazon, Google, Salesforce, Tumblr, Twitter, and Yahoo filed an amicus brief to support synthetic sex identities at the expense of boys and girls' rights to physical privacy in public bathrooms. Google recently funded the largest LGBT youth organization in America, the Trevor Project, with millions of dollars to build an artificial intelligence system. The Trevor Project has also recently partnered with Astellas Pharmaceuticals, makers of puberty-blocking drugs. As well, the tech sector is highly invested in the development of augmented humans and synthetic identities, uh, synthetic realities. Beyond Ray Kurzweil's singularity, uh, Elon Musk created the first neural implant device for humans called Neuralink to help people navigate computers with their minds. Mark Zuckerberg has his own brand of virtual reality system called Metaverse. Yuval Harari, working closely with Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum, is considered one of the world's most influential public intellectuals. He believes the most important challenges facing the world are technological disruption, ecological collapse, and nuclear threat. He thinks that within a few decades or a couple of centuries at most, humanity will upgrade itself into a different type of species through our technological advances. He also makes the connections between synthetic sex identities and transhumanism, excuse me, and speaks about a coming virtual reality for humans overlaid on the biosphere. 
We have become compulsively addicted to that which does not reciprocate. And this rapid advancement of fetishes to express our sexuality is representative of this. Humans are connected to the biosphere by sex. The deconstruction of sex in language and law and the manipulation of young people's sex characteristics seem to pave the way for further encroachments into our biology and our more complete melding with technology. Synthetic sexes work as a grooming process for the public to accept more violations of our physical boundaries while also providing young, healthy, resilient bodies to experiment on. Putting these developments into the context of unfettered corporatism, an economic system that pursues profit like a heat-seeking missile that is destroying the planet, treating our home like a bottomless well of resources to feed itself, it appears that humanity is next in line for colonization. Our technologies suited to this market have created glorious cathedrals of civilization, but the planet's coral reefs are disappearing and there are Texas-sized islands of plastic in the oceans that we don't know what to do with. We have obliterated and tortured so many other species to grow our magnificent technologies, and the radioactive waste at Fukushima is still growing. Our planet's water has been poisoned and sold back to us in plastic bottles that wind up as gyres in the ocean. We have extraordinary towers of learning that are teaching the next generation that allowing this system to devour them too is the zenith of freedom. The market has finally come for humans. Dressed up as gender expression with its eye on our genetic codes, gender ide ideology opens the door. The market is standing there dressed to the nines and we're inviting it in for a full course meal. It will probably be our last, unless we can understand what we're looking at and use whatever free will we have left to organize and resist synthetic sex identities institutionally, legally, and politically. Thank you. I can stand. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yes. Just raise your hand high. Wait. Uh. Come on up. Thank you so much. Um, Jen, we've been friends for a while, so I think you'll probably, um, I, I, I think you'll understand the reason that I'm asking the question. Uh, and I have two questions. The first one is, you seem to very seamlessly talk about someone named Martine Rothblatt followed by pronouns like he and him. Mm -hmm. And you seem to very seamlessly use a name like Jennifer Pritzker and then a, a, address him in the third person using he and him. That doesn't seem to be problematic for you at all. You don't trip over the pronouns. You just call a man man. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about that and how our society seems to have been caught up in it. And then my second question is, I know you to be someone who, and, and you talked about it in your talk, that same-sex attraction is one thing, and this other thing called gender ideology or the gender industry is a very different thing. And I'm curious about your use of the acronym LGBT, because the T is very different from the LGB. So how do you feel like that all fits in? Well, I don't feel like it fits in at all. I mean, from the talk, you can, you can basically gauge that. Um, transgenderism is basically a fox in the hen house. It's being used to deconstruct sex. And the way to do that, the way to do that, uh, the way that they're doing that is um, through the human rights for same-sex attracted individuals. It has to be a human rights movement. They would never have gotten as far as they have got 
if it wasn't connected to the LGB. Also, LGB are really, they have become corporate identities. They might not have started out that way, it was just same-sex attraction, and they had names, okay, to describe themselves. But with the advent of the AIDS crisis, they became corporatized identities. Um, so, and the way that corporatism works is that they split, um, they split uh, things apart in order to open markets. So like for instance, we used to go to the physician, the general practitioner, and he or she would treat our whole system. If we had a hangnail or if we had cancer or if we were pregnant or whatever we had, right? The general practitioner basically saw to all of it. Now we have a specialist for anything that could possibly go wrong with us or whatever they invent is wrong with us, right? Um, so this is how the uh, medical industrial complex has turned into a $10.7 trillion business, you know, enterprise. And it's a beast that needs to be fed because if you live under corporatism, then you, you need to grow in order to subsist. So you need to open your markets. If you're gonna sell makeup, you know, uh, and you're gonna se sell white makeup and uh, black makeup, you're not gonna make as much money as someone who's selling, selling makeup of all these different shades, right? So gender identity goes in there and you know, basically makes all these shades of sex, right? So that's what it's used for. It's opening markets in sexual identity. And it creates a, a consumer base. Um, and uh, I wanted to say something else about that and it fell out of my head, sorry. <laughs> and um, yes, seamless uh, transition from you know, Jennifer being a man. He's a man. He's a man. Martin Rothblatt is a man. They are men. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing mystical or magical about it. You know, they've had some surgery, they've had some tweaks, and they've taken some drugs, and they're still men. You know, so, but this corporate illusion, this m mysteriousness has been created around these individuals. And I think it's imperative that we use the correct pronouns this is why pronouns are so important. Do not buy into the pronouns. I do follow the money and this is where it's led me and in terms of genetic manipulation is it all bad I don't know and we don't know because we don't ever get to discuss that that is the problem we have techniques that are developing without our consultation without our participation that are going to impact the lives of future generations so it's not the technology itself it's where it's going and where rich billionaire oligarchs are taking it for their own, um, their fetish, their sexual compulsions, their ideas about um, a tech utopia. You know, they are driving this with gobs of money. This is what they're doing. This is what they're manipulating us. They're manipulating human evolution. Do we want this? Well, I mean, I kind of like my humanity myself, you know, like just the way it is. <laughs> You know, I might feel differently about it if I had more information, if I was consulted, if it was discussed between other people. But those discussions aren't happening. This is just full throttle ahead with major bank. Yes. Where is the interface between medical insurance for people who are not wealthy, that they can afford some of the things that you were saying would be so expensive to do these trans um, creations, and how, or are they being subsidized you know, by these big farmers so that they can reach further into the ordinary vulnerable child who goes for gender dysphoria and feels, you know, I've heard so much of the world 
kids go to the net and, and they're encouraged uh, in their transformation. And well, if your parents don't like it, then we'll be your clear family. And my immediate reaction is that who's going to pay for all this when you are a normal citizen or from a normal financial background? Well, the insurance um, companies have been basically bought and the corporations are bought. So in, the insurance is paid for by the corporations. Their insurance is covering these surgeries for not only for you know, adults, but for their children. Um, Medicare, Medicaid? Uh, I don't know. Yes, okay, well, Brandon can tell you. Um, and the other question you asked, I'm sorry, I just fell out of my brain. Yeah, I had something to say about what else you said, but uh, you know I can't remember what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, the joys of getting older. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Yesterday, a woman from the human rights campaign stopped in the street and asked me if I wanted to celebrate transgender rights today. Um, what's the market benefit? Well, again, transgenderism is a grooming mechanism. It's a rebranding of an adult male fetish. Okay, that is um, that it's a dissociation from their own physical body. They're they're uh, coveting female biology for themselves, right? So it's they're dissociating from themselves, right? And they're also objectifying women, right? So and the medical industrial complex. This is just the beginning what we're seeing here. This is just the grooming process, the fertilizing of the ground for more, more types of manipulations to, the hu to human bodies. You know? And they're working on young children who are healthy, you know, physically healthy, and have you know, emotionally and mentally vulnerable, but physically healthy. Their bodies are resilient, their bodies are healthy, their bodies are young. And these are the people that they, this is the, the experiment that they want, you know, they, they want to experiment on people, so they're, they're using children. It makes sense. Um, but there's going to be, I mean, if you want to meld yourself to technology, or they want to meld you to technology, you're going to need an awful lot of surgical supplies, you're going to need an awful lot of drugs, anti-rejection drugs, antibiotics, you know, uh, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, the sky's the limit, really. Well, um, how can I how can I put that? Um, well, for instance, let's take uh, Elon Musk's um, Neuralink. That's artificial intelligence. Uh, we're all working with artificial intelligence all the time now. We talk to it on the telephone. You know, when we want anything at all, <laughs> you know, we're talking to a machine. You know, we open up our computers. You know, this is you know this is. Algorithms, it's, it's uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I think artificial intelligence is actually a misnomer. I think it's artificial communication. Uh, it, was, uh, it doesn't really think like the way that we think, you know, but we think that it thinks the way that we think because it talks to us in the way that we talk to it, you know? Um, but so, um, so the neural link, it's, it's going to be implanted in the head, and this is gonna be for Alzheimer's patients, for uh, people who are depressed um, and have other issues, other psychological issues, to have a disc, you know, planted into your head where, you know, it can control your biology, right? So this is artificial intelligence being actually implanted into us, right? Instead of like us carrying it around 24 seven, right? I mean, we're already halfway there, we're already half bought, you know, so. It's really, you really want to go all the way? <laughs> I mean, you really got to start asking yourselves this because it's no joke. These men have money and they are moving fast. Thank you. 
some of these medical companies are um, profiting from, say, like ads on social media platforms to kids. There's a lot of ads uh, kind of for like mail, you know, um, uh, basically you can order cross-sex hormones in the mail, that sort of thing. Um, and how much are they, are they profiting from that? I'm interested in part of space on that. And then, um, yeah, I, I think there's another question as well, maybe more philosophical. How, you know, given how much time teens are spending online, on social media, on their smartphones, I think it's about uh, just shy of nine, nine hours a day on average, um, how might this also be contributing to the obfuscation of our embodied limits that you talked about? Um, and, and how do we think through alternatives to that? Get your kids off tech. Get them off tech. Because the medical industrial complex is all over their social media. You don't even know. And also the porn industry, which also serves to dissociate children. They are being traumatized with sexual material that they are not ready for. And I'm convinced that this is intentional because they want them to dissociate from their sexed bodies through trauma, sexual trauma. Children don't need this, and it's all over their social media. Even the children's children's programming, like YouTube for Kids. Parents put their, their kids on, on YouTube for Kids thinking, oh, well, this is innocent enough, right? They don't have to you know, check it out and see what's going on there. Uh-uh-uh. You know, they got, they've got porn um, influencers on there, and um, TikTok recently uh, partnered with uh, Planned Parenthood, who are the largest suppliers of uh, hormones for kids. Um, in the United States, uh, Johnson and Johnson, these gender surgeons, they all, they go on TikTok, they're on Instagram, they're, they're all over there, they're social media advertising their wares, you know? Um, and you've asked me too many questions, you know, I'm 63 years old, you're killing me. <laughs> and I remembered the, um, the thing that I wanted to say to you was that, because you said, you know, real gender dysphoria, you said something about real gender dysphoria. You know, gender dysphoria is an obfuscation, again. Okay, gender, just get, get rid of the word gender, throw it the hell out, and start talking about sex. Yes, people have... Um, complication, complicated feelings about their sex, you know, and children, the more that they hear about this, have more and more feelings about, bad feelings about their sex. Um, and, you know, we also live in a pornified environment so that young women, when they're going through puberty and their body starts to visibly change sexually, you know, and carry, you know, uh, all of a sudden uh, catches the attention of grown men and boys who have been learning about sex education on their little flip phones, you know, typing in porn, are now, you know, projecting that onto the girls, and this is the education they're getting, and they're freaked out. You know, they're freaked out about their bodies changing. Um, so gender dysphoria, you know, I've got a real problem with that, with that concept. You know, there's, there's also a, um, a uh, what do you want to call it, a body, identity, a body identification identity disorder, or maybe the other way around, body identity... <laughs> identity disorder. But it's um, people that have this feeling that their limb doesn't belong to them and they want to be disabled. And it's a very, very intense sensation. Some of them have actually gone and tried to remove their own limbs. But doctors won't take the limbs off, right? And yet, we have no parades for these people. We have no modeling agencies for them. We have no makeup lines for them. We have no um, magazine uh, covers for them. They're not brave and courageous. You know, and there's not a whole lot of them because it's not very profitable. Right? This is, this is an ailment. Big Pharma creates a problem, and then they try to solve it. Right? This is an engineered problem. And it's, it's taken on the, um, the aspects of a, of a contagion, a social contagion, which, you know, have gone on throughout history in many different countries. You know, the, lob the lobotomy craze, the, um, the uh, abused by the devil craze, or the laughing craze, you know, n laughing nuns, you know. There's all sorts of them throughout history. But this one is actually engineered on purpose. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, it's 
My second question is, when is the book coming out? <laughs> my first one is, um, is anyone else other than you doing this expose of the profit behind this? Because it seems to me that that is gold. And, and, and when we're looking at this issue and we're thinking about how to combat what so successfully pushed on us as a human rights issue, it's very hard when that angle has been successfully launched to push back. But if we can push back on the idea that you're being used for someone's profit, it seems like that is the really that is the way to. And that's why I'm doing it, and that's why I've been screaming about it for 10 years, right? The website I'm sorry? The website? The website? Yeah. Is the 11th hour blog .com. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, that is the key. And many people are talking about it from many different angles, and I've been trying to encourage people to, to even if you're going to talk about, like, say, women in sports, absolutely talk about this issue, confront it on this on this front, if that's where you live and you breathe, you know, definitely attack it on that front, but bring in pharma. Sports medicine is billions and billions of dollars. You know, they're all connected. They're all connected. The media is all connected to pharma. You think you're, you're looking at something on Cosmo, Mag the Cosmo magazine on breast finding, which in fact they had? Well, you're not looking at something on Cosmo magazine. You're looking at a conglomerate that controls the message of all these different platforms. And they're all sending the same message. This is positive. This is human progression. This is normal human development, expressing yourself through surgeries and drugs by the medical industrial complex. But other people are starting to talk about it now, which is why I'm moving the goalpost now for myself. Because you know, now that they're catching up, now it's like, okay, so now let's move to the transhumanist part of this. Because this is the, you know, this is where they're really going with it, you know. Uh, like I said, plenty of profits for now, but later, you know, with all these manipulations to humanity, there's gonna be a lot more profits to be had.